Dear Anwar, yes. it's a great pleasure to be with you in this format uh, uh, again. Uh, we did our first exercise like that uh, last year, and uh, as it was discussed in the previous uh, session with uh, Khaldun al Mubarak, the world uh, has changed uh, since the previous edition of the World uh, Policy uh, Conference. So um, I think we the conversation we are going to have is a natural continuation of the previous one with uh, Khaldun al-Mubarak, who focused uh, essentially on the economic uh, and business uh, dimensions. And uh, perhaps the uh, starting point could be the following. I uh, read with great interest, as I told you, a speech you recently uh, uh, gave at the uh, Emirates Policy Center uh, here in uh, Abu Dhabi, and uh, you uh, described, uh, the, you analyzed the foreign policy of your country uh, by formulated eight uh, core uh, principles. So I will not uh, ask you to, I, I could ask, read uh, the eight uh, core uh, principles, but to start with, I would like to focus on the very first one. The first one, is the, I read it, and uh, the, the first is that the primary goal of our foreign policy must be to promote the prosperity and security of the United Arab Emirates through an approach that blends our national values and our national interest. I, I like this very much because, in fact, uh, any uh, serious country could start by, uh, with a sentence uh, l l like this. So, uh, may I ask you to say a little bit more about your national values and your national interest? I, first of all, uh, it really is a pleasure to be here again uh, with you, Terry, and to continue, really, our conversation uh, from last year. As you said, uh, a lot of things have changed, and as I was driving, coming to the conference, I was just thinking that you know we've had this uh, Ukraine uh, war, the Ukraine uh, earthquake, really, in international politics, which was not even on the horizon when we were talking to each other uh, a bit more than a year ago. I think uh, again, you know, without going to the uh, to the principles I outlined, I I, I really want to say that uh, we are really consolidating what we have been starting as uh, you know, a direction uh, following the Yemen war. Uh, and that consolidation really is along these uh, two principles that you spoke about. On the one hand, to not only speak about security and stability, but also to ensure that prosperity is actually an equal uh, pillar. So I think this is something that we have been uh, trying to do. And I think uh, in the previous conversation that uh, we had uh, with Khaldun Mubarak, uh, you can see that very clearly. We're very, very focused on making sure that prosperity becomes a pillar that is equal to what has been traditionally a Middle Eastern country search for stability and security. This uh, brings about really uh, the issue of that you just asked me. So what are these principles? And in, in that perspective, uh, I am really speaking uh, purely about how we act in the international, uh, in the, in the international system. And I think from that perspective, our position on Ukraine is a very, very clear example. I think it's very reductionist and very simplistic to come and to a country like the UAE and say the UAE is neutral on Ukraine. The UAE is not neutral on Ukraine. The UAE is uh, affected by the crisis on Ukraine, and the UAE is trying to find the right balance between our principles and the necessity for a political uh, solution and an end to the war in Ukraine. 
So if you take our principles, again, where we are, our size, our region, number one tells you that the use of force in international, uh, in international conflict is something that really worries us a lot. So clearly, any use of force is something that we uh, clearly see is not part and parcel of our long-term interest. And that's a major principle here. I think the other uh, issue here is uh, the idea basically also the, uh, the, 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 what I would say is the attack on the sovereignty of a state is a real problem for us. I mean, a lot of countries have changed borders due to historical circumstances. I don't think there is a country, or if there is, there's one or two or three that have had fixed borders over the last 100 years or so. So clearly, this is another principle that we can see that has an implication on the region we are, on the country we are, and, and so on and so forth. But I think also to balance this, we don't think that uh, the crisis in Ukraine uh, is a crisis that can be resolved uh, through uh, a military conflict. I think we've seen the lessons, for example, of World War I, the Versailles Treaty, where a country is defeated but rises again to try and change the international order. And I think from this perspective, the idea basically of trying to find a solution is necessary. Now, in any, uh, in any conflict, there's always a peace party and there's a war party, whether it is on the Russian side or whether it is on, uh, on, on the Western and Ukrainian side. People that think that just give us four more months and we can change things. Just give us another few weeks and we can change things. You know, we've gone through that same cycle in Yemen, to be honest where, uh, you know, on the ground, we always thought that three more weeks will change things and will allow us to uh, negotiate from a better perspective. Now, what if that doesn't happen? So clearly, I think what we are trying to do, and I think our vote in the UN uh, Security Council and in the General Assembly and in the Human uh, Rights Council shows very, very clearly that this country is not neutral on Ukraine. This country is trying to actually uh, balance what it sees as its principles and at the same time, a way out uh, of the crisis. I use Ukraine, of course, as an example because I think it is very pertinent currently. Can we, thank you very much. I, I, I must say that I personally, in my own view, the world I subscribe 100% with uh, what you are saying. But uh, if we can spend a, uh, a few more minutes on this uh, issue, because it, is, it concerns all of us, yes. uh, it, it is uh, difficult uh, to be uh, balanced. Uh, for instance, in the discussion uh, a few minutes ago uh, with uh, Minister Kuleba from uh, Ukraine, uh, he stated clearly that uh, he's, uh, I asked him about his vision of victory. Victory means uh, kicking out uh, the, the Russians uh, from the entire uh, territory of Ukraine in the borders, in the 1991 borders. And uh, in his view, uh, there is no way to start any uh, kind of negotiation before this goal uh, is achieved. And the last question I asked him, I told him, if I were uh, President Macron instead of me, what would you tell me? And he said, well, Mr. President, thank you for this and that, but uh, uh, please uh, do not give uh, any, I, I, I translated it with my words, do, do not provide any exit uh, to uh, uh, saving face uh, exit uh, to, uh, to Putin. So this approach is totally incompatible with what uh, we are saying. Well, I, again, I mean, I understand uh, Foreign Minister Kuleba's views because he is the one where his country is uh, being devastated uh, and territory belonging to Ukraine also occupied. But I think also uh, from where we are, 
uh, perhaps we have more of a neutral view, so to speak, about conflict and crisis in general. And I think uh, what, uh, and, and then I, I have to also say that the ability of the UAE to affect these effects is not very big because we are uh, a medium-sized country in, uh, in the Middle East, uh, on the Gulf. So our ability really to affect all this is perhaps positive on the margins, but not really central in the, uh, in, in the main conflict. But I would come and say, I would argue that the world today is much more dangerous, much more complicated, and the way that we are looking at the future uh, is less and less assured about what I said about stability, etc. And I think again, we have to centralize the idea of diplomacy and the idea of political solutions. I mean, again, I don't want to argue point by point on this, but I think conflicts. Uh, are more likely to end in uh, a political, uh, through a political process than through a military process. I mean, that's just a fact. So uh, now, uh, compared to last year, you know, Khaldun uh, al-Mubarak uh, answered the question, uh, the comparison, uh, concentrating on the uh, globalization aspects, business, technology, uh, and all that. Looking uh, now on the uh, classical uh, security dimensions, from the viewpoint of your country, what would you describe as the greatest danger, the greatest uh, threat, the, uh, a kind of uh, worst case hypothesis? Well, again, I, I think on, on a macro level, it's about really uh, commitments as we go further. Uh, uh, we are a country at the end of the day that has uh, always had uh, a Western and uh, specifically an American overall cover for how they see the security, not only of the UAE, but the region. Uh, is that going to be assured for the next 30 years? Is that implicit uh, assurance of US security uh, for the region starting from the Doc, uh, Carter Doctrine, going to continue and be more explicit for the next 30 years. I think on the macro level, that's one of the big challenges. I think on the, on the more, if, if we drill down, of course, the nature of the threat is changing. I think the region here today is more concerned about specific threats. We're not going to see uh, a threat, uh, epic threat, uh, such as uh, the invasion of Kuwait, for example. I don't see that as the scenarios that are uh, transpiring. But I see, for example, more concern about four or five threats that are more specific. Uh, terrorism remains uh, a real threat. We keep our eyes open on Afghanistan and other places, because, and, and even on Yemen, because that remains a major threat. In my uh, opinion, cyber is becoming more and more also of a threat because, uh, as you see, uh, as our societies become more modernized, our dependence really on all these systems makes us also more vulnerable as, uh, as it makes our lives easier. I think the third issue, of course, is drones and, uh, and, 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 and missiles. I mean, Saudi Arabia has been uh, targeted by more than a thousand missiles and drones. These are mostly uh, Iranian origin used by the Houthis. But again, suddenly this issue has, sec has not really catapulted into being a, a major, major issue until these weapons, you know, such as drones have gone into the Ukraine theater. And suddenly the world has rediscovered this issue. While, you know, we have seen this as a major, major threat in the other period. And I think then we continue with uh, security of the sea lanes, whether it's for energy or whether it is for uh, uh, trade, commerce and, and trade. So as we move forward, I think 
the commitments of our traditional strategic allies. Is it still there? Yes. Is it going to be turned? Including the U.S. And uh, as especially... We as we discussed recently yes, yes, yes. here. Especially yeah. the yeah. U.S. Is it there? Is it going to be explicit? Because I think it is important. If it is there and it is explicit, then this is a major cornerstone for the next 30 years. But if it is not there and it's not explicit, it means a lot of countries in the region will have uh, to, uh, to, to, to adapt. Now, my last point also on this is all this also shows that uh, as we're going into this more dangerous zone and more unpredictable zone, I think there is a lot more for uh, diplomacy and regional diplomacy in particular. The understanding that I might not like what the Iranian regime is doing on certain things in the region, but I have to talk to it. I have to try and make sure that the conduit of communication uh, is uh, open. I have to ensure that although there are things that I don't like, but I want the uh, principle of non-interference in internal affairs to be enshrined because this is something that will also benefit me. So there's a lot, in my opinion, as we move forward that we need to do uh, regionally. Now, I always say this is not uh, naivety. It's not naive, but uh, it is just the reality, and we have to get better at it. So uh, one of the developments of last year is the failure of... Uh, uh, saving the GCPOA, the, the nuclear uh, agreement with uh, Iran. Originally, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Trump, President Trump, is to a large extent responsible for that, but this is the reality today. How do you assess uh, the consequences of uh, Iran probably uh, becoming a nuclear power in the relatively near future? Well, again, I think you need to look at also our uh, position on the GCPOA. And our is not only the UAE, but I think collectively Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states. I think we were uh, very much opposed to a GCPOA that did not take into account uh, the Iranian regional activity and Iranian missile program at the time. I don't think the word drone was in, uh, in, in, in the conversation. I think we moved from that position uh, with the sort of revival with Obama uh, signing of the JCPOE and all the drama following that during the Trump and Biden administration to what I would call a resigned position. A resigned position meaning that this is something that has already been decided. Uh, we can't really do much uh, in terms of, uh, of, of changing the, uh, you know, the, the equilibrium, the agreement, the revived agreement. I think today we have a, a different situation. I think today uh, we have a situation where uh, we see that the JCPOA is most probably is unlikely. There is a still a small opportunity, window of opportunity, but I think uh, Iranian demands on the one hand, uh, and at the same time, developments later on internally, and at the same time, a hardening really of Western public opinion about how they see the JCPO, even within Europe, in my opinion, makes that much more difficult. Now, as it becomes more difficult, are we worried about uh, uh, you know, a, a, a breakout? Yes, we are worried, worried about a breakout. But I think we are also more worried about this sort of uh, you know, massive production of cheap missiles and, and, and cheap drones uh, within the whole region. And I think the region ultimately needs some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of, uh, again, diplomacy is really the solution of trying to make sure that countries, not only countries, but also non-government organizations and militias and so on and so forth, being actually owners of uh, cheap missiles and cheap drones. So 
I don't know where we're going right now. I know that most probably the JCPOA as it stands is most probably not going to be done. So we have to wait and see. But I think this is an opportunity for all of us really to come and uh, revisit the whole concept. And, 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 and I always say that using the five plus one for, uh, format is a positive thing because then you ensure that whatever concept you have has the sort of uh, international force and legitimacy uh, to, uh, to back it. So in my opinion currently, we have to wait and see where this is going on, but I think we really do need to revisit the whole idea of uh, regional intervention, the whole idea, what are the rules of engagements as we move forward, not only about Iran, but about, I think about the whole region, because we have to incentivize Iran also at the same time. We have to come to Iran, and we know that a lot of the turmoil today in Iran is about also economic uh, concerns. So from that perspective, I think Iran has to be included at some stage in this sort of pillar that I call of stability and prosperity. We have to incentivize it. We can't just be, uh, you know, we can't just criticize its nefarious activity, but we have to try and bring it in somewhere. I don't see this happening immediately, but I think as we discuss and as we talk, and I think as the region understands that more and more it has to be more responsible for its stability, I think this is something that is unavoidable. Last year, uh, you expressed uh, very elegantly, uh, as always, uh, the wish uh, that uh, the European Union were more united uh, in terms of uh, f foreign policy. Would you say that things have improved or deteriorated since last year in well, this I respect? Think I think the language that we are hearing today about engaging with the Gulf is quite positive. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to wait for the actions. I think that language is also partly driv driven by self-interest. Again, trying to find a new uh, you know, gas uh, providers, new oil providers, that whole, uh, uh, you know, ospolitic uh, of trying to, uh, you know, to, uh, to engage with Russia, I think, is broken down in Europe. And as a, re a result, this is something that will take a long time for it to, uh, to mend. Uh, it is fine for uh, European countries to prioritize, or many of them to prioritize, uh, their interests uh, in the region, to look at the region, so we're hearing some uh, good signs, but I think it has to be strategic. It cannot be transactional, in my opinion. This is, this is why I mention your elegance, because uh, you wouldn't say what I say, which is that the Europeans have no strategy. Well, um, you said it, it's right? It's my responsibility. Uh, you said it, and I heard it. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. But, but I think what we're hearing, and I think especially from the Germans and others, about re-engaging with the Gulf, uh, I am encouraged. But again, I would warn that it should not be transactional. I think there are, there's huge interest between us and Europe. And I think there's always been this discrepancy between some of uh, the national policies, and the French is a good example of linking with the area, and I think uh, with, the, with some other policies that as are just loading it with moralistic baggage and loading it with other interests. And politics, I think, in my opinion, is, has to be more in, along the Hans Morgenthau uh, school of, of realism uh, if you really want any results. I am happy to say, as you know, that once again, I am 100% uh, in agreement with you. I think that uh, politics may implies being realistic in the short term and with some idealist uh, vision course, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the longer term. This is not what uh, we are doing. But, uh, 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 and also, uh, I think we should 
we, we, we should underline the importance for Europe of, uh, of, of the Arab world, of the Gulf countries, and to a large extent the African uh, uh, countries. Um, and uh, I think we have to repeat time again that uh, this should be a concern, a major concern for, for, for the European Union. So I, I think you, you, you would not yeah. disagree with that. No, definitely. I think yeah. definitely. But as I said, you know, we, yeah. we need to see the actions. We need Absolutely. to see the sort of realignment. No. Uh, we need to see more contacts. But I think at the same time, it has to be long term. It has to, to be strategic. We will always have, you see, I always say we, we will always have great, good relations with Europe. Mm -hmm. The difference is really about a relationship that is just good or a relationship that's strategic. I think that's really the big difference there, you know. With Khaldun al barak spoke of patience and rapidity in execution. Said so what, what, what is missing this rapidity in execution, in, in execution, a way. Yeah. Uh, can we spend the last uh, few minutes on um, uh, coming back to the UAE? You mentioned diplomacy many times. There is a highly, uh, very distinguished uh, institute of diplomacy here in the UAE, and the Emir uh, uh, gave your own name to this uh, institute, which is called the Anwar Gargash Institute of Diplomacy, because of the uh, services uh, that you have uh, rendered to your, to your country for many, many years. So may, uh, w one of the uh, mysteries of uh, the UAE is that it is indeed a, a nation. I think it's very difficult not to think of the UAE as a nation, but with a very small uh, minority of the population uh, being natives. Uh, and uh, it seems to work, and it works uh, in a remarkable way. Uh, but talking about uh, diplomacy, you need an army of diplomats, if I may say so. So because to to achieve uh, the, the your goals, that is being active diplomatically, uh, almost everywhere, because uh, you need a very strong uh, diplomatic uh, force. So uh, can you tell us a few words uh, about how you are year after year uh, achieving this goal? Well, I think the first uh, part of my remarks is uh, about the UAE. I think the UAE, I think it is classic in a lot of the uh, Gulf writings on, uh, you know, the sort of what we call population imbalance, is to see uh, the foreign presence in many Gulf countries as a threat. I think we turned that around in uh, a few years ago, and we started thinking of it as uh, a positive element for the UAE. If you read a lot of the Gulf writing of, uh, you know, the different nationalities that are not only part of the UAE, but part of every single Gulf countries, I think in the last few years, we came to a conclusion and said, for our next, you know, for all our lives, the composition of these, co of these countries, of the UAE, will actually include this sort of uh, huge diversity. So why should we look at them as temporary, transient, but we need to look at them really as positive and something that will enrich our society, uh, so to speak, a talent of pool. So this has uh, to, uh, a pool talent. This has, I think, changed uh, the way we look at things. I think the second element also, I was looking at numbers about naturalization of people who have lived in the UAE, and our rate is better than Finland, for example. Over the last 40, 50 years, a lot of people today that uh, you see as Emiratis are people who have become Emiratis through nationalization. This is not something that we adver advertise a lot, but our rate is as good as Scandinavian countries, really, when you, when you look at it. Now, this comes back to how do you take your uh, limited uh, human resources and try and put them in a large in a larger uh, and ambitious diplomatic uh, outreach in my opinion you can't do everything so 
we have, in my opinion, two, three things we need to do. Number one is we need to manage our environment. Our environment is basically the Gulf, the Middle East, the Arab world. And our environment is really turbulent, problematic, and for us, don't really expect a lot to gain back from our environment in terms of economic benefit, etc. but it has to be managed. So I think if you look at the first goal is to be engaged in the region in more of a management mood, but you know, we also have good successes here. There are plans to invest in Turkey. There are already plans of cooperating with Israel and Jordan and Egypt, etc. These are quite positive things. I think then number two is to manage your traditional partners, the EU, ca national countries that are part of the EU, the United States, uh, the rising countries in Asia, China, India. So again, trying to also understand more and manage more is another area where we need to look at. And I think we've always also uh, had a, a group, a layer of countries where we think are major and we need to put some effort in. And here I, I mean countries like Brazil and Indonesia, where we traditionally, like Brazil, do a lot of business, but are not necessarily totally engaged or understand Brazil very well, etc. But we need to understand it more because they are bigger partners for us trading, etc. And I think recently, for example, what we are doing with Indonesia is extremely important. Our trade with Indonesia is very small. It's about $2.6 billion compared, for example, with our trade with India, which is hitting the $70 billion uh, uh, ceiling, for example. So our idea is we need to invest more time and effort in a country like Indonesia and try to quadruple that. Uh, investment and trade portfo portfolio. So clearly, if you look at the world as 190 countries plus, we are spread very thin. But if we look at uh, the world from the sort of uh, circle, so to speak, of where we need to put more effort, I think this is a little bit more manageable. So last uh, question. Tomorrow evening, I think that we'll, we will close with that. We have the visit of the uh, Saudi Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Prince Faisal Al Faran. So, what uh, would you recommend me to ask him? <laughs> I don't. I don't think you need any recommendations. But I think the first thing is uh, it's a word about. Uh, about what's going on in Saudi Arabia. I think the, what is going on in Saudi Arabia is phenomenal in terms of uh, societal, economic change. And I think that this is something that is positive for the whole region. I think this is a process, and a process will, of course, bring its own challenges, but I think strategically, it's extremely positive. I think, on the other hand, uh, I, th I see our relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia as, uh, as uh, uh, complementary, where I think a larger uh, regional pie in terms of economy, in terms of investment, is something that we everybody will uh, will will benefit uh, from. So clearly, as you see, more uh, locations for tourism, as you see, more industry, as you see, uh, more uh, enterprise, it means that this whole pie in the Gulf is becoming larger. I think it is significant, for example, that the UAE, which is a country under 10 million uh, population, is going to hit for the first time ever, uh, half a trillion dollars of GDP this year. And this is quite significant for a country this size. And I think, how, you d how do you do that? You, part of it is actually dealing with a more uh, vibrant environment. And part of it is dealing also 
uh, with a more dynamic environment. And I think definitely what's happening in Saudi Arabia is more vibrant and dynamic. So these will be my comments, and then you can use them the way you want. Thank you very much. I, re I will remain discreet, <laughs> and I will not tell him that I asked you uh, yeah. <laughs> that ask your, your advice, but thank you very much for, this, you. for your answer. Now, uh, unfortunately, these conversations are always too short, thank so you. time is up, but I do not want to close this session without telling you again a uh, heartfelt thank you because uh, the WPC would never have met uh, here in uh, Abu Dhabi without, uh, without you. And without I'm our collaboration. Without actually. our uh, uh, relations. So thank you, thank thank you. you very thank much you. again. And um, I suggest that we applaud uh, Dr. Gaga. Uh, thank you. Shukran. Thank you.